Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Haldane will now give us his second lecture. Uh, at the end of the lecture yesterday, I suggested that anybody who had any questions to ask of him should send their um, questions on a slip to the radio personnel here to be transmitted to Professor Haldane. Uh, no questions have so far been received. Now, um, I think most of you will recollect that uh, Professor Haldane, in the course of a newspaper interview some time ago, said that we in India are probably too polite. What he was meaning, I believe, was that he wanted that anything which he said or any other scientist or anybody else said should be viewed in a critical frame of mind, an analytical frame of mind, and not merely acquiesced in or um, regarded in the affirmative. Consequently, if um, no questions are asked, he will perhaps feel that uh, whatever he has said is simply being acquiesced in out of politeness, and um, I certainly think he would appreciate questions to be asked which will also incidentally indicate that um, his lecture has been of the very great interest which it ought to be. In fact, I think yesterday he gave us an extremely illuminating uh, summary of the position of how evolution has taken place and it included geology as well as Indian philosophy. So uh, I would uh, again suggest that any questions which you would like to ask might be jotted down in writing, and Professor Haldane will try to cover it in his tomorrow's lecture. Yesterday, I gave uh, what seemed to me to be good reasons for believing that <clears throat> all living beings on our Earth are descended from a common ancestor. Now, when we say metaphorically, that all men are brothers, we mean, among other things, that they have common ancestors. We also mean, of course, that they are alike in their mental processes and that therefore they have similar rights and duties. Now if we say that all men are brothers, we can say that the animals and plants are our cousins though rather distant ones. Let me be quantitative. I think it is probable that if any man or woman who lived 100,000 years ago is the ancestor of any living man, he or she is the ancestor of us all, of the entire human race. To find a common ancestor for a man and an insect we should have to go back about 7,000 times as far into the past, so the insects are pretty remote cousins. But does the metaphor mean any more than this? Can we find evidence that animal minds are like human minds? I shall try to show you that we can. I shall even try to convince you that the sexual reproduction of plants involves emotion. Now, we cannot prove that animals are conscious, but then I cannot prove that you are conscious. However, you will be glad to know that I believe it. I also believe that a cow or a bird is conscious. We can, however, prove that animals have behavior which we call moral or social when we find it in men. Marriage is one of the most fundamental of human institutions. It is found in all societies, though its forms vary, and most of us think that the kind of marriage prevalent in our own society is the best kind. Does it exist in animals? I define marriage as the association 
of a male and a female for economic as well as sexual purposes, for atta as well as karma, preceded by a ceremony and normally lasting at least until the children no longer need parental care. Clearly, many animals do not marry in this sense. But even so, some elements of human marriage may be found in rather unexpected animals. In my laboratory in London, we used to breed a little fly called Drosophila subobscura, weighing somewhat less than a milligram. That is to say, ten crores of these flies would weigh as much as one man. Now, if you put a male and an unmated female together in a small glass tube, they soon meet. The male stands in front of the female and flicks his wings in a characteristic way. The female then begins to dance with rapid movements to right and left. If the male can follow her motions and remain facing her for a minute or so, they usually kiss with the ends of their proboscises and then the female permits mating. But if you look more carefully, you find that many males cannot dance adequately and are kicked off if they try to mate. A certain amount of ceremonial is necessary. Now, in this species, a female will never, in our experience, mate again on the same day. If she hasn't begun to lay fertile eggs, she will often mate again next day. But if she has once started laying fertile eggs, she will hardly ever mate again, even after 30 days, which is about the equivalent of 30 years of human life. For these flies usually live more than a month, but rarely as long as three months. The males, however, I regret to say, show no such fidelity. Clearly, we have here some, at least, of the elements of marriage, even if not perhaps the most important. Now, marriage, in my opinion, is seen at its best in birds. Our small English songbirds have a fairly general pattern. Early in the spring, a male bird occupies a territory by singing vigorously along its boundaries and perhaps occasionally fighting intruding males. Unmarried females listen to the song and they look at the male and at his property. If the female flies away, the male does not chase her. If she stays in his territory, he makes various songs and postures to the female and gives her food. This is often called courtship, but as we see, this phrase is just a little misleading. After a period of living together, which is often of several weeks, they build a nest. Usually, both spouses build, but the hen may do it alone. When the nest is finished, the birds mate. But this does not generally occur till they have known one another for a month or so. When the eggs are laid, the male may or may not help to keep them warm by day. He almost always does so at night. And he usually helps to feed the children when they hatch. During all this time of active family life, the male generally continues to dance in front of the female and to give her food. Some water birds give one another little presents of water weed, which they do not eat, but which they seem to enjoy. As J.S. Huxley first pointed out, 
This behavior can serve as courtship, but it is quite equally important in keeping a married pair together and stabilizing the marriage. So, of course, does comparable behavior in human beings. Most of our small British birds, though not all, are monogamous. But Mr. Salim Ali tells me that an industrious male Indian weaver bird may make several nests and induce a different wife to live in each of them. The ladies do not apparently meet, so there are no quarrels between them. Small European birds are mostly short-lived. Thus, only about half the adult starlings, a bird similar to the minor and of about the same size, only about half the starlings living today will be alive in December of next year. Hence, a survivor is about as likely as not to be a widow or widower next year. So these small birds commonly marry afresh in each year of their lives. Now, I don't shoot birds at any time, but it seems to me much worse to shoot ducks, for example, during the part of the year when they are married than during the remainder of it. A duck is certain to die sometime, but it may escape the sorrow caused by the death of its husband or wife. If you've ever watched a pair of ducks on a tank searching for one another after even a few minutes of separation, you will hardly doubt that this is a real sorrow. Larger birds commonly marry for their joint lives, and it is not rare for widows or widowers to refuse to marry again. Some European species of lizard also behave in this way. The widows, and even more so the widowers, attack other members of their species pretty savagely. Mammals don't furnish such good examples of monogamy. They tend to group themselves in units larger than the family of two parents and their children. This, of course, is a step towards the evolution of society, but animals find it rather hard to reconcile it with monogamy. So we find the nearest approaches to the human ideal of marriage among not very social mammals, such as tigers. This does not, however, mean that other wild mammals are quite promiscuous sexually. It is a curious thing that in popular speech, at least in Europe, I don't know whether it's so in India, such words as animalism are used to mean sexual promiscuity. I think this is because Few of our domestic animals are monogamous. The most nearly monogamous is the domestic pigeon. But there is no doubt that domestication has corrupted our cattle, sheep, and so on. A bull who will not mate with any cow, or a cow who will not mate with any bull, is likely to be killed in Europe. Even in India, it will not be much used for breeding. So there is a heavy selection against animals whose conduct approaches that of which we approve in men and women. And it is not fair to blame the domestic animals for the results of, no doubt, often unconscious human selection. But now I want to defend fish. A few species of fish, especially of the family Cichlidae, contract marriages after a fairly elaborate ceremonial courtship and are usually faithful when offered a further choice of mates. 
this kind of behavior is almost confined to fish living in lakes or very slowly moving rivers for a quite obvious reason. A pair of fish, once separated in the ocean or in a large, quickly moving river like the Jamna, are unlikely ever to meet again. In still water, they may have their home in a bed of reeds or other water plants and learn their way back to it. Such fish do well in an aquarium, provided one can find them mates whom they accept. But if they do not hit it off, they're very liable to fight rather savagely. Now these still water fish often look after their children. At the fisheries research station at Katak, I was shown a pair of Tilapia mozambicensis, a freshwater fish of African origin, which is bred in tanks in Indonesia and whose introduction into India is being considered. One of the workers at the institution poked a fish with a stick and it immediately spat out a hundred or so of its children from its mouth. If it had been caught, they, or some of them at least, might have escaped. It later took them into its mouth again, where, of course, they would have been safe from most other fish. In some species, both father and mother may protect their young in this way and the parents' throats are often blocked by a growth of flesh after breeding so that they cannot swallow their children accidentally. Casual observation of such fish has given rise to the quite untrue legend that they breed from their mouths. Other fish, for example, colisa, which is quite common in Bengal tanks, look after their young as follows. The male and the female blow bubbles among the water plants. When a nest of bubbles is ready, she lays eggs in it and he fertilizes them. The father then guards this nest of bubbles against animals which might eat the eggs and when the young have hatched, he guards them too for some time. Many fish, as you know, move in shoals and thus have, obviously, at least a rudimentary social organization. Now, there is as yet no evidence that bees or ants or other social insects can recognize other individuals, though they certainly can tell members of their own hive or nest from those of another nest by their smell. But fish can tell one fish from another. Goetz trained a small fish, a minnow, to come for food when water in which one and only one of 12 other minnows had been swimming was put into his jar. That is to say, this fish knew other fish as individuals. He knew the difference between their odors or tastes as we know the difference between the faces of different human beings. Now this recognition of individuals may be a basic difference between insect and vertebrate societies. And clearly, a society in which one couldn't recognize individuals is not such a high form of society as one in which one can. And the fact which I have mentioned is, I think, another refutation of matsyanyaya, fish logic, and an argument in favor of those 
who object to killing and eating fish. I have shown you then that some animals are models for human moral behavior. We may say, if we like, that their conduct is instinctive behavior, not moral behavior. Perhaps the animals feel no desire to leave their spouse or eat their young. So much the better. We do not always take human conjugal fidelity for granted, but we do take it for granted that parents will die of hunger before eating their children, and we should severely blame any who ate them. It is not possible, in my opinion, to draw a sharp line between instinctive conduct and moral conduct. But someone may say that even if some animals have laudable instincts, they have nothing like human intelligence, and in particular, nothing like human language, which requires intelligence to use. I have heard various public speakers, both in India and outside, speak of the great scientific discoveries of this century. In every case, they referred to discoveries about the fine structure of matter and usually drew the moral that they had been misused to make atomic bombs and so on. I personally think that only two of the discoveries of this century in physics are of really profound philosophical importance. One is Einstein's discovery that time and space are aspects of the same kind of relationship. The other is that the distinction between two particles of the same kind, such as electrons, is not absolute. We haven't yet got the words to formulate this principle adequately, even though Bose has given us at least an adumbration of how to put it. But the principle helps me to believe that the distinction between you and me or the nearest mosquito and me is nothing absolute either. However, in my opinion, the scientific discovery of this century of the greatest philosophical importance was made by Frisch. He discovered that hive bees have a language and managed to understand at least some of it. <coughs> His work was done on European bees, <coughs> and as even their languages differ slightly, there is little doubt that those of Indian bees will be found to be still more different. So what I shall tell you may not all be true of Indian bees. Let me explain why I think that Frisch's discovery is so important. We each look at the world from a rather different point of view. Some see it mainly as a system of conscious beings, though those who do so often think of human beings only. Others see it as a system of particles or waves, others again as a system of duties. The object of philosophy is to decide between these and other points of view, or at least to reconcile them if this is possible. It is very valuable, therefore, to find out how men and women of other cultures look at the world. But if so, it may be much more valuable to find out how non-human beings do so. Of course, Frisch's work is only a beginning, but it seems to me to open up the possibility of new worldviews for us men. A beehive is a family whose mother 
the so-called queen, but perhaps goddess would be a better metaphor, may live for some years. The workers only live for about six weeks in summer. The first three weeks are spent usually on duties in the hive and the remainder in gathering food and occasionally water and a kind of cement which is used in building. The foraging bees fall into two classes. About one in 20 looks for new sources of food and the others go where they are told. As all the bees in a hive are usually sisters, we do not know how this important distinction arises. If a bee has found a plentiful source of food, whether in flowers or in a dish of scented sugar water offered her by a professor, if that food is within 50 yards or so of the hive, she flies back and dances round and round on the vertical surface of a honeycomb. Other bees follow the dancer, smelling her back with their antennae. If they are accustomed to visit flowers with the odor which they find on the dancer, they fly out in all directions and look for a flower with this particular smell or a dish of sugar water with this particular smell. A few may change over to a new flower or fly out for the first time after following a particular dance. These facts were discovered by marking individual bees with tiny spots of lacquer and using a hive with a glass window. Incidentally, as soon as this was done, Frisch found that although a hive looks very busy, each individual bee spends a lot of time resting or just gossiping with others. Few work for more than eight hours a day. But if the food is several hundred yards away, the dance is quite different. It consists of straight runs in a certain direction, ending with a turn to the right or left, and another run along the same path. During the run, the bee waggles her abdomen to and fro. These dances were described by the Greek philosopher Aristoteles, or Aristotle as we call him in England, 2,200 years ago, but it was von Frisch who discovered that they were a language. If the straight part of the dance is vertically upwards, this means that the food source is in the direction of the sun. If it is 30 degrees to the right of the vertical, it means that the source is 30 degrees to the right of the sun, that is to say, in the northern hemisphere, north of the tropics, 30 degrees to the west of the sun. The distance is signaled in two ways. The number of turns made per minute goes down as the distance increases, and the number of abdominal waggles in each straight run increases by about one for each 75 yards of distance. However, what is communicated is not really distance, but time or effort. For the dance is slower and more waggles are made when the food source is up here uh, or up the wind so that more effort is needed to get to the food. Now, how accurate is this signaling? The bees spread out a bit round the direction signaled, but the center of the various directions is usually correct 
within two or three degrees. This means that the bee's communication is more precise than such a human phrase as northeast by north, but not so accurate as such a phrase as 17 degrees east of north. The distance is apparently judged correctly within 5% or so. This again is very good by human standards. How many of you would say that a house is 530 yards along the road? I think you would be quite content if you had said 500 yards or 600 yards. But the most startling discovery of all concerning bee communication was made by Frisch's pupil, Lindauer. When a hive becomes overpopulated, some of the bees leave it, usually with the old queen or goddess, while one of her daughters replaces her. The swarm may hang on a branch for several days, Bees fly out from the swarm in all directions looking for a site for a new hive. When they have found one, perhaps in a hollow tree or in the roof of a house, they report back and signal the direction and the distance by dancing on the swarm. Other bees fly out in the direction indicated by the dancer and if they are satisfied, they, are signal, they, may, they will signal the location to other bees. A bee may change its mind, first going to one site and signaling that, then following a dancer and signaling the new site. It may change its mind, but if it continues in its old opinions, and if others don't agree with it, it may retire from politics into the middle of the swarm. This is all India now, Lindauer gives the records of several debates of this kind, some of which f lasted for more than a long German summer day. Usually, unanimity is reached, but a swarm may split in two. If so, the goddess, if I may so call her, goes off in one half, and the others follow her later. Now this, I think, is a really great discovery. Here is a highly organized community with no private property. It is, if you like, a socialistic society. But it is not a dictatorship or a tyranny ruled over by one individual. Nor does it show any signs of being ruled by a group soul as the Theosophists hold. On the contrary, there is within this community a diversity of opinions, and one of these finally prevails, not by violence, but by persuasion. There are certainly other means of communication in the hive, including at least one smell, which serves to attract bees to a source of food within five yards or so. But apparently, no sounds are used. We don't yet know, for example, how bees cooperate to make the honey cells with the beautiful precision which is achieved. How they decide to swarm. How they regulate the temperature of the hive by bringing in water in hot weather and many other things. If bees observed human beings, they might the report Russia. something like this. These large creatures are clearly very stupid and have no real language. Many of their dances are crudely erotic. However, in southern India, some precision has been reached. But even here, the mudras appear to signal emotions or other mental states rather than hard facts. There is not the faintest evidence 
that they can communicate either direction or distance. By the way, you will have noticed that the two examples which I have chosen to demonstrate the similarity of animal and human minds both refer to social behavior. This is not accidental and is of some philosophical importance. Please do not think that I am arguing that animals are better or more intelligent than men. Some of them are better in some respects. But if the distinction between good and evil has any meaning, I do not think we can avoid the conclusion that some animal and plant species are evil. Parasitic worms, for example, cause the slow and often painful death of animals, including men, in which they live. And they themselves have lost the nervous system and sense organs which their ancestors almost surely possessed. Whereas the tiger, for example, kills quickly and possesses beauty, intelligence, maternal love, and many other good qualities. If we are to speak of the unity of life in the sense that we apply human standards to other animals, we shall certainly find evidence of evil as well as good throughout the living world. I consider it most important that Indians should take up the systematic study of animal behavior. You may object to my giving you advice. You have a perfect right to do so. This study can be of economic value, but I am thinking of its cultural value. In the past, Indians have been almost alone in refusing to eat animals, in providing hospitals for sick animals, and so on. It is not my business to defend such attitudes. But I can say that, in my opinion, they are very much more easily defended if they are based on scientific facts discovered in a careful study of animal behavior. You have, in India, a few great observers of wild animals, such as Mr. Salim Ali of Bombay. There is room, literally, for thousands more. In particular, the study of Indian bees requires no expensive apparatus. We already know that Indian bees dance. We know very little more. In a country, where the sun can be overhead, this is it is obviously hard to use it as a compass. But Lindauer, in a few weeks in Ceylon, found that the bees there could recognize a deviation of the sun from the zenith, which he himself could not. In other words, although their eyes are not so efficient as ours, which can be proved by quite simple experiments, the indria, or as I would put it, the nervous analyzer behind the eyes, is somewhat more efficient than the human one. Now I want to pass to another aspect of the unity of life, the cooperation between different species. The antagonism is obvious enough. Animals eat one another besides eating plants. The cooperation is perhaps most usually between very different kinds of organisms. I shall give just two examples. When we speak of a rat, for example, we are apt to forget that the rat includes crawls of bacteria with independent lives of their own, which live in its intestines. However, it is possible 
to rear rats aseptically, that's to say, with none of these bacteria in them. At most, the bacteria provide some substances of which there may be a shortage in the rat's food. Probably, though we don't know it for certain as yet, a man could get on without bacteria. Though again, he would have to take some care that his diet was complete in certain respects. But a cow or a horse couldn't live on anything like its normal diet without bacteria and protozoa. By protozoa, I mean single-celled animals of very simple organization. A cow can live on grass. You and I cannot. Her digestive juices are not very unlike ours, but her stomach has several different compartments, in some of which there are various different kinds of single-celled organisms which help the cow to digest plant materials which she could not use without their aid. Incidentally, they produce the pleasant smell which characterizes the breath of a healthy cow. She spends a lot of time chewing the cud which she brings up from uh, her stomach to her mouth and takes down again, thus aiding the protozoa and bacteria in their work of breaking up her food. Similarly, termites, or white ants as they're generally called, though they're not at all closely related to the ordinary ants, cannot digest wood by their own unaided chemical efforts, but they contain protozoa which can do so, and therefore they can live very largely on wood. We are much too apt to think of protozoa and bacteria as responsible for diseases such as malaria and cholera. Most of them are harmless, and what is more to the point, they play an essential part in the cyclical changes which matter undergoes in the community of living organisms by converting dead plants and animals and their waste products into chemical substances which the higher plants can absorb from the soil and make once more into living matter. It is one thing to have one's digestion done for one by organisms of another species. It is much more remarkable to use another species to feel one's emotions. But consider flowers for a few minutes. They contain the sexual organs of plants. In the center, we usually find the stigma, a slightly moist surface, which is the external female sexual organ and is at the end of a pillar called the style. Around it are the male organs, the stamens, which produce the pollen. When pollen is carried to the stigma, the pollen grains if they are suited to it, burst, and microscopic tubes grow down from them into the female style, and finally, after traveling a distance, which may sometimes be several inches, this is all India Radio they fertilize the cells called ovules in the ovary below it, which then develop into seeds. However, the most conspicuous parts of a flower are usually the petals, which are commonly brightly colored and highly scented. There may also be nectaries producing a sweet fluid. Every flower, and particularly 
those parts of a flower which men and insects appreciate most is a sexual symbol. I repeat the word symbol. Now many flowers are self-sterile. Pollen from any one plant will not produce seeds on any of the flowers on it. What is more, a self-sterile plant is generally a member of a gotra, no members of which can be crossed with other members. I use the word gotra not out of condescension to an Indian audience, but because there happens to be no English word for such a group, and it is quite an important idea for plant breeders. Membership of a gotra is determined both by the father and the mother, and the discovery of the rules by which this is done was one of the most beautiful achievements of genetics, a science of which I shall say a very little in my third lecture. Even when plants are self-fertile, when there is no gotra system, they usually yield both more seed and more vigorous seedlings if the pollen this comes from another plant. Recording. Now this cross-pollination is usually done by insects which are attracted to, to flowers both by their colour, by their form, and by their experience that they are sources of food. Both all those facts have been proved quite conclusively by experiments with coloured paper models scented in various ways. Bees, butterflies and many other insects are attracted by the bright colours of flowers and by their regular shapes. It is clear that the aesthetic tastes of these insects are not very unlike our own. Though bees can distinguish colours invisible to us in the ultraviolet and cannot see red, or more accurately, cannot distinguish red objects from dark grey ones. The vegetarian birds, or at least some of them, share these tastes. Other groups of animals, as you know, have very different aesthetic preferences. It seems to me that these facts too, when we know more about them, may be of very great philosophical importance. Now when a bee visits a flower, it finds certain colours, shapes and odours satisfactory. It may also drink the sugary secretion of the flower, the so-called nectar, or it may gather some of its pollen to store in the comb. It then visits another flower of the same species and it may leave some pollen in it and cause a sexual union of the two plants which engenders one or more seeds. We may say that the love of the plant is the bee's aesthetic emotion, the lust of the plant is the bee's hunger. This point of view should not, I think, be quite novel to those who have read the Yoga Vasistha or the philosophy of Josiah Royce. If a long-lived celestial being had visited our planet once in every 10 million years or so, he or she would have seen the first trees some 300 million years ago. They were like our tree ferns, pines and so on, and the herbs beneath them were not unlike our ferns. The fertile parts of our planet were a rather monotonous green. Then, in the Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago, flowers appeared, although they were at first very unlike most modern flowers. They became useful to the plants because of the psychological evolution of insects. 
The earth had put on new colors because there were at last animals which could appreciate them. Somewhat later, many plants developed fruits with bright colors and smelling usually not unlike the flowers. The birds and the mammals ate them, but often carried the seeds for some distance. This is all India Thus, Radio although the plants cannot move, they can use animals first to enable plants at a distance to mate with one another, and later to allow their children, the seeds, to travel and to find new places to grow. It is not quite a metaphor to say that the monkey's pleasure in eating fruit is the mother love of the fruit tree. All this cooperation is, of course, shot through with evil, or at least what appears to men as evil, so long as we can use this word meaningfully. Insects, for example, may eat the fruit without transporting the seed. But it is nevertheless true that for most of a hundred million years or so, the ancestors of the human race seem to have been cooperating with some of the higher plants, eating some of their fruits and seeds and scattering others. Of course, this cooperation was unconscious. As soon as it became conscious, agriculture started. But there had been a long preparation for agriculture and for its more intellectualized form, plant genetics. By the way, please don't think that no animals practice agriculture. Some Brazilian ants collect leaves which they take underground into their nests and on which they plant a fungus which they later eat. Each winged female who flies out and may become mother and goddess of a new nest as she weighs about this a thousand times as much as any of her children except the future uh, reproductive females, we can use such a word as goddess perhaps, she carries a little of this fungus in a pocket near her mouth and plants it if she finds a nest successful. Now what I have said today may seem to you very subjective. It is certainly my own point of view and not all other biologists will agree with it. But it is based on the study of biology over some 60 years, largely a study of what a philosopher might consider minor details, such as the shapes and sizes of bones of extinct animals, the chemical composition of my own blood, the inheritance of flower shape and color in primroses, the ascents of koi fish for air. Without such studies, one is not, in my opinion, very well qualified to form an opinion. If I wish to make a new translation of Kalidasa's works into English, my first task would be an intensive study of the details of Sanskrit grammar. My next would be not merely to read the texts and other translations of them, but to discuss them with pundits who had special knowledge which I lacked. So I am afraid that I am this not always Radio as polite as I should be to people who propound a philosophy of life after reading a few popular books on biology. What India needs, again in my humble opinion, from a cultural point of view, is careful and loving observation of Indian animals and plants, preferably 
while living under natural conditions. I am glad to see signs around me of the beginning of such a study. To take just one example, this year, Dr. Runwal, the director of the Zoological Survey of India, has reported his observations on the behavior of wild bees during a partial solar eclipse through the Indian National Institute of Sciences. This means, among other things, that young zoologists who observe animal behavior need not despair of obtaining posts 